webinar for compensatory education funding and free and reduced price meal applications. Um, if you're here, you saw the TAA last week and we're wanting to, to discuss um, the other opportunities to um, seek out uh, student status as economically disadvantaged. Um, and then we're also, because of the, the flexibility that USDA has offered. Uh, and so um, I have a team with me that we're gonna present on some information and then um, open it up for some questions. Um, if, if it's helpful though, go ahead and, and ask your question as each, each of the presenters is presenting. And then at the end, your question may have already been answered through one of the other presenters' information. Um, and if, if it wasn't, then we will also still try to address it. So um, I'll go ahead and get started. So the purpose of the, oops, the purpose of today's meeting is to support LEAs in collecting student economic status information in or, order to maximize the supports to students by earning the funding the students and families are entitled even when a flexible food option is being utilized. So as I mentioned, the, the flexible food option, the, the seamless summer option or the summer seamless option, I get those two words confused. So I, I, if you've seen me speak before, then I just start using SSO so that I don't get those two mixed up. Uh, that, that's a flexible option that, that districts and charter schools are able to, to utilize. And so um, it may cause some concern on how you will get information, the economic status of students. And so that's what this presentation is going to, to uh, provide today. So up first uh, on, on the agenda is myself, David Marks. I'm the Director of Financial Compliance with TEA. Um, after I speak, um, Lena Wilson with the Texas Department of Agriculture. And then we, we invited Cypress Fairbanks Independent School District to, to speak with us and Karen Smith and Darren Crawford will speak. And then you'll hear from TEA again in, on the PEAM section and Jamie will uh, wrap things up with with PEAMS coding, and then we'll open it up for questions. So on this slide, I wanted to outline all of the different programs that um, are dependent on a student's economic disadvantage status. Uh, and, and so when you, when you read this list of programs, it's, it's uh, rather lengthy. Um, most of us uh, focus on the National School Lunch and Breakfast Program but there's, there's a whole host of other programs that are dependent on this information. Uh, State Comp Ed, many of you are aware of, of the changes that HB3 made, and so uh, that's dependent on this information. Your Title I federal grant program is dependent on this information. E-rate is also dependent on this information. Another new allotment from HB3, the teacher incentive allotment, that's dependent on this information. Of course, pre-kindergarten, this is one of the, the qualifiers, so that is dependent on this information. The early education allotment, uh, another one created out of HB3, that's dependent on economic status of a student. The college, career, and military readiness allotment depends on this. And then the pandemic electronic benefit transfer program also is dependent on this economic disadvantage status. So you can see that the even beyond the, the school lunch program, that there's a lot of programs that require this information and need this information in order for, for districts to receive their full funding and then to be able to provide that funding and those services to students. So to, to say we don't need to collect this information is a misnomer. And, and so um, in the, the next group of people, we'll talk about um, activities on um, how to collect this information if it's not through the traditional lunch app. Um, but um, I'm going to go ahead and outline each of the programs and where it, where it shows in the statute that um, they need the, this information. So for state comp eds, as you're aware, it's for supplemental programs and services designed to eliminate any disparity in performance on assessment instruments between students who are educationally disadvantaged and students who are not educationally disadvantaged. And then also for students who are at risk of dropping out of school. And then it can also support the um, eligible uh, Title I um, school-wide program. 
And then the bottom bullet shows, um, if you remember how we're using it for funding. So each student that um, is determined to be educationally disadvantaged. And then you look, then you look at what census block group they're in. And if y'all remember uh, from previous slides or pre previous presentations that you've heard, the census block groups determine the weight of, of the amount of money that the student earns. And so um, it's the, the basic allotment times the weight assigned, uh, and that goes all the way up to a 0.275 times the, the basic allotment. And once again, the very first initial item for to, to start generating um, comp ed funds is that students are determined to be um, educationally or economically disadvantaged. And then I also wanted to highlight for you uh, something that we've announced in the last few weeks. Uh, there's a change to state comp ed funding for this year only. So it's a change for 21, 22 only. Students who are entirely virtual, so served in a way that would not count for daily attendance under the, the SAL, ham, the Student Attendance County Handbook, but they're considered enrolled in your district, can generate at least some funding under the, the foundation school program. That's the link to the FAQ that we have this posted. Those students, so those students who are 100% virtual, not earning the traditional FSP, um, they're considered enrolled, not in membership in your district. Um, you will code those students as an 09. And then from there, uh, determine that if they're educationally or economically disadvantaged um, through your, your whatever means uh, your district is choosing to use, uh, and that will um, turn on the uh, state comp ed funds for that particular student. All right, switching programs. So the purpose of, of Title I is to provide all children significant opportunity to receive a fair, equitable, and high quality education and to close educational achievement gaps. Um, and um, it provides financial assistance to LEAs, so the local educational agencies and schools with high numbers or high percentage of, of children from low income families to help ensure that all children meet challenging academic standards. So as, as you're aware, the Title I also requires and is dependent on the economic status of your students in order to, to flow funds to, to, um, from Title I. Along with those, we've also used the allocations from Title I um, for this, the um, ESSER funds that, that have been um, given out uh, or granted by the federal government um, is relying on that information as well. So, your um, low-income families and who have been determined to be e educationally or economically disadvantaged for Title I uh, is also, um, you're receiving a, a benefit for them from Title I and the stimulus funds. E-rate, another federal program that provides schools and libraries affordable access to telecommunication services. Um, you can receive a discount of 20 to 90% on your telecommunication services, internet, internal connections, and basic maintenance of internal connections for eligible schools and the economic needs of your students. The level of economic need is determined by the percentage of those students eligible for the National School Lunch Program. So as you can see, E-Rate also requires and needs this information in order to maximize your discounts uh, that you may receive from the, the Federal Communications Commission. Teacher incentive allotment, as I mentioned, this is a relatively new allotment. Uh, it was passed in the 86th session uh, under House Bill 3. And this provides um, a, well, the goal is to provide teachers to have access to a six-figure salary. It provides school districts under this section, offers resources to the district to increase teacher compensation and priorities prioritize funding for high needs in rural district campuses. And then way down there and number two, it shows um, a, um, a weight. And so based on that weight from least to most severe of the economic disadvantage, according to the census block group in which the student resides, for a student whom the district receives compensatory education allotment funds under 48104B or E. So what that says is that based on your, the student's economic status, 
and then their census block group and their their neighborhoods around the the campus that will also determine the weight of the teacher incentive allotment that your district may receive. And then state funded pre-kindergarten. Many, many of you are aware of the requirement for a, a student to be eligible for the pre-kindergarten program. Um, it's number two in the list of uh, five items, I believe, uh, and that's that the student is educationally disadvantaged. And then 4803, a student um, who does not apply is entitled to benefits of an education school program if the student is enrolled in pre-kindergarten class under section 153, 29153, which points back to my top bullet. And then um, the additional amount um, in 48.005J talks about the, the um, the charters or districts who operate a pre-kindergarten program, uh, and then it gives the, the minimum number of minutes for the, that those programs have to achieve. So once again, student one, class, one determination for students to participate in the state-funded pre-kindergarten program is that the student status uh, is determined to be educationally disadvantaged. And then the early education allotment, um, this is for, for students who are um, uh, in, up to third grade to improve literacy and math. And these students uh, generate a, a, an allotment with um, a weight of 0.1 times the basic allotment if they are educationally disadvantaged. And then if they are an um, 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 English learner, then they would qualify for both. So once again, the early education allotment um, will pay a, a 0.1 times the basic allotment for any student that is determined to be educationally or economically disadvantaged. And then in college, career, and military readiness allotment, the incentives allow district to earn additional funds for preparing graduates for college or career or the military. And then it goes on to say that a district can earn an outcome, annual outcomes bonus of in that top number one, if the annual graduate, graduate is educationally disadvantaged. That's um, pointing back again to the education or the economically disadvantaged status of that student. And so you can see that this program uh, also relies on that information. And then I wanted to wrap it up with just these are so all of those programs were benefits to both the district, they earn additional funding, then they also will um, those those ad that additional funding should be directed back to the students to provide those additional services that those students need. Um, and so what this slide does is, is kind of outline the benefits of what it is to a particular student or to a family. Um, uh, whenever an educate an ed economically disadvantaged status is determined, and so those students who who qualify for free or reduced lunch, um, you can see there's several um, opportunities for them or their families um, uh, to to benefit from that. So it, it reduces costs on the ACT and SAT. It it helps them in determining financial aid. It provides them free or reduced meals. Uh, advanced placement costs are, are reduced. Um, some colleges will waive or reduce the application fees. Uh, many of you are aware it helps in accountability ratings and, and how we calculate the accountability ratings. Um, it provides for additional money to families through the PEBT program. And then also the emergency broadband benefit, which provides discounts for broadband uh, and on uh, computers, laptops, uh, those types of, of items. And then um, it also may provide free or discounted athletic fees. Uh, and this is a similar slide that the TDA had sent out uh, earlier this month. And so it's something that I wanna highlight as you're talking to your families about it, uh, you might consider incorporating this one or the TDA slide um, into, into your um, information that you're talking to your family so that they're aware of this information. And next, Lena will uh, be speaking and she's with TDA. It's saying that I'm not able to share my screen. The host is disabled. So. Good 
mean, I think I just gave you the necessary permission, but let me know if that's not the case. And are you able to hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Great, I hope you can see my screen. We can. I will go on and get started. So I'm gonna provide you with an overview of the options that you may have heard about, but um, are not exactly sure about what the impacts are. And so um, we'll get started. So for this upcoming school year, USDA released some flexibilities that will allow all school districts to feed all students for free. And when USDA released this guideline under the nationwide waivers, they indicated that part of the rationale for that was to ease the administrative burden on school districts during the pandemic. And so basically USDA issued an aerial eligibility waiver for the all school districts operating the school feeding program. And what that means is everyone is able to feed their students for free, and they have not been mandated to collect free and reduced lunch applications as in prior years when they're operating the National School Lunch Program, because they would be doing so this year by operating the seamless summer option where lunch applications are not required. The other thing that occurred this year uh, was that PEBT benefits were extended. And because we are not required to accept lunch applications for the seamless summer option, um, a lot of confusion on, on food about what do we do for students who have a desire to utilize PEBT, and we'll talk about that. So, um, if your district opts to utilize the seamless summer option, they needed to make that decision. They needed to fill out a document for TDA um, where they are going to identify that they are accessing that waiver. It is for the entire school district. And so you can't pick some campuses to have um, the seamless summer option and some to still operate the old national school lunch program that would accept lunch applications. There is still a media release required where you are going to identify to your parents in the community that the seamless summer option will be utilized and that all students will have the ability to eat free for the school year. And we have all of those resources available on our squaremeals.org website. So you don't need to reinvent that. The advantage for the shift is that not only did USDA allow school districts the opportunity to operate the single summer option, but they allowed that at the higher summer food service program rate. And that rate is about 15% more than the typical national school lunch program rate. So as you can see, there's a significant financial benefit to child nutrition programs who opt to operate the seamless summer option instead of the National School Lunch Program for this school year. So these reimbursement rates went into effect on July 1st, um, and they will remain in fit until June 30th of next year. Um, I think you can see from the um, rates, the advantages and why TDA has been emphasizing for the school districts who are able to operate the seamless summer option to do so. So these um, flexibilities, we USDA issued a number of waivers and there were some that required notification to us to say, hey, we're going to do it. And there were some that were seamless and you could continue to operate without notifying us. And we would check that at the time of an administrative review or, or um, a quality check as we are out um, doing follow-up on the waivers that have been implemented. So 
some of them that are not requiring you to tell us other than that you are going to operate are the area eligibility waivers where everyone can eat free. So all we're going to need to know is that you're operating seamless summer or if you're going to operate one of the after school snack programs and you will tell us that through the way you submit your application for operation this school year. So every year you have to do that. And this year, when you do that process, we will automatically know that you have opted in for this option. There was also some flexibilities given on the local wellness policies that are normally required. And in this case, there's been an extension where um, you have additional flexibility. Um, and some of you might have submitted that for last year, but if you want to use that again for this year, you may. Um, and there is a form whereby you notify us that you have opted to do so. And again, that is on our Square Meals coronavirus page. So what is important for TDA to know about and is tracked and monitored more closely are the waivers that you see here. So if in your school district, you have to close due to an outbreak or there's some um, modifications to your schedule and you want to send meals home for multiple days with students, you would have to notify us that you are going to be doing that. There are provisions where you can send up to the five days of um, school food home to the students, um, but you have to inform us that you intend to do that. Um, and you have to inform us before you begin that distribution method. Um, we will issue you approval, so you will have that um, for when we come around to do our reviews, and you'll be able to show that that was approved. It's important because we have to check that as part of our review process this year. And um, these all will expire at the end of June, so you are able to use these flexibilities for the school year. If you are a school district and you say all my kids will eat in person, we're not doing any of that bulk distribution, that is certainly your right. And you do not have to take advantage of this waiver, but it does give you the flexibility in the event that you are serving virtual students or in the event that you have an outbreak. These are the other areas where we have to have notification is if you um, are not allowing your students to eat on campus in one spot. If you have changed your meal service times to uh, in your schedules to better manage distancing, you are able to have waivers for that. If you are going to allow parents to come and pick up food for students who are not learning on campus, you are able to do that. Um, Off-site monitoring, if you have your campuses closed, there is some regular monitoring that happens every year and it's required to continue to happen on your child nutrition operations. There are provisions for that monitoring to occur remotely. And so certainly reach out to us if you need additional assistance. But if your campuses are open and you have people in person, then you can continue to do that on site as well. And then there has always been a requirement that in high school, the students can choose what they take or don't take. Um, and that has been a provision that has been optional in the lower grade levels. There is a waiver where you can say, all kids, we're gonna fix you a pre-portion item, package, sack lunch, whatever. You're not gonna have choices. We're just going to package you the meal that we're providing to everyone. And you can also include high school. If you make the decision to do that in a high school, you will need to notify us. And that is one of the waivers that we need the notification for. There is a decline and declare form at squaremeals.org that we need everyone to fill out. And on that form, you are going to tell us which of these options I've just discussed you intend to use. If at some point during the school year, you no longer want to use these options or these flexibilities, you can certainly change the use of these flexibilities. What you can't change is the provision to go from operating seamless summer um, back to NSLP during the middle of the school year. So for those who are operating seamless summer, you have submitted your applications to operate the seamless summer program, 
you will operate that for the entire school year. We have heard ongoing feedback about the difficulty with supply chain challenges and ordering and food and so forth. And USDA has addressed this through a couple of waivers. One is a sodium waiver that you cannot comply with the more stringent sodium requirements that are um, in place. And you can um, send us a request and we will waive that requirement for the entire school year for your school district. So if you are having to serve a lot of prepackaged items because you are unable to um, do as much from scratch as you have in the past, it makes sense for you to at least submit for this waiver so that you are protected in terms of the meal pattern in, in a review. Um, and so you are able to do that and it would be in effect for the entire school year. The other thing is um, the meal programs that we just talked about. You would be able to let us know about that. So let's talk a little bit more about PEBT because we know this is where there has been a lot of confusion. Um, and the issue with PEBT- Hey, Lena, can I pause you just for a minute? I'm sorry. Um, we will post the presentations on our website. Um, so you don't have to put in the chat your email address. Um, we've got lots of chats that uh, people want a copy of our presentations. And so after this is all over, we will post them on our website. Sorry about that, Lena. Thanks, hey, no problem. So let's talk about PEBT a little bit because this is where there has been a lot of questions and phone calls to your school districts. And we have heard about this on our weekly school calls on a regular basis. So the caveat about um, PEBT is that it required um, a student to have participated in the National School Lunch Program and to have had an eligibility status determined. So if you are operating in a school district, um, then your, and your school district is a CEP, a Community Eligibility Pro Provision School District, then that information was automatically provided to Health and Human Services. And they were able to identify that all of your students had the eligibility to receive these benefits. Additionally, Health and Human Services Center had all of the information from students who were already participating in the SNAP program. So those two populations were already covered, already going to receive PEBT benefits. What was expected is that there would be a smaller in size whereby there might be people either new to the area or who were eligible for these benefits and, and needed a way to apply. And so Health and Human Services set up a website during last school year, and we talked about that. We, we, we messaged that it was important that people who were not automatically um, had their eligibility status shared could submit an application on the HHSC state site and gain eligibility for PEBT. So if there were stragglers or people who wanted to access the benefits. Anyone who accessed those benefits last school year automatically received the benefits for the summer. So there is a little confusion because there is no requirement that every family submit an application, household or otherwise, to access PEBT benefits as they have the majority of the population who would be eligible already in their system. What was supposed to happen is there was supposed to be a means by where which um, a person could apply if they had a need and they had not already had an eligibility status uh, established by the school district. And the reason that's important is because last school year, many of the school districts in Texas chose to operate the seamless summer option, or they chose to operate the summer food service program, and they did not take applications. And if they didn't take an application, the child may not have had a new eligibility status established. So I hope that gives you some background on how all of this rumbling um, started. 
USDA issued some guidance that said that if a family were to show up at a campus, it was the responsibility that they be issued a household application, which is what is normally used for the National School Lunch Program and allowed to apply for PEBT for this past summer. And that's where some of the calls and the, all of that increased. Um, and so we wanna differentiate what, what happened for the summer versus what happened for last school year because last school year, most of those activities have concluded with the exception of some um, revisiting of status or some challenges to status and approval that might be occurring for um, individuals. But the majority of the last year PEBT is over and we are moving now into resolving the people for summer PEBT. Now, Texas's plan was approved on August the 16th. So we do have clear guidance on how we are moving forward. There's going to be a complete media campaign whereby additional information is provided to hopefully clarify some of the confusion. Um, we did have a conversation with HHSC where we, we voiced to them the amount of work and calls and frustration from parents because they're, they're not understanding what they need to do and not to do. But all of those resources are on HHSC's website because they're administering the PEBT program. One other thing to let you know about, um, any one school who continues to have families who come in and say, I would like to apply for PEBT for the summer benefit of $375 per student, would have to be given a household application up until August the 28th. And that is what the date in our plan is. After August 28th, the schools do not have to provide PEBT benefits um, and PE applications for the establishment of PEBT benefits for the summer. We have no guidance yet of TD if um, USDA is going to continue this program into next school year. So here is the application that is familiar to most of you on this call, or if you take electronic applications and you can make it available for the determination of PEBT. And the other way you can make it available is for the purpose of establishing carryover eligibility for the start of next school year. So you all will remember that every year you usually have the first 30 days of the school year where the, the students are able to maintain their prior year eligibility so that you don't have to haggle with people having to pay for meals that they don't have the means to pay for. So that is still an allowable use of the application. And the reason it's important to remember this is because with operation of SSO, applications collection is not required. So if you are doing that, and if you are doing it ex ex specifically for the point of establishing PEBT eligibility, then there were some PEBT administrative funds that you could use to pay for that. You cannot use child nutrition funds if it's solely for that. But if you are using um, these applications to establish your carryover for next year, so you don't have a lot of students showing up without a designated eligibility status, where you're having uh, you know, extreme amounts of charges and so forth, you may want to um, decide if that is the right thing for you is to um, address carryover. So these templates are still available for you. If you um, elect to use SSO, remember it's optional and there's only one exception to what we're talking about and that's for a school district that has community eligibility provision schools, because if you are community eligibility uh, determined, you are determined as such based on your directly certified free students. And therefore you are not able to use this household application at all for the establishment of an eligibility. So I know that's a little bit confusion, but if you are operating CEP, or uh, 
provision to the school, you cannot collect our um, household application. Um, you are able to um, use child nutrition funds if you are establishing carryover, uh, but there were PEBT administrative dollars that can be used to uh, reimburse your child nutrition staff. If you're saying, I only want to establish PEBT, I want my staff who know how to do it to do that, then you just need to reimburse them or make sure that the child nutrition fund is reimbursed for that labor that is uh, being utilized outside the what is necessary for our program. Okay, that is all I have. I'm sure there'll be some additional questions for me, but I'll turn it over to our next speaker. Thanks so much. Thank you. Sorry about that. Hopefully everybody can see the presentation. I was having trouble getting it to allow me to um, unmute. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Darren Crawford, um, our Director of Nutrition Services, and I will be presenting um, our, how our district has implemented processes uh, to ensure we are in compliance and how to uh, maximize funding. Uh, my name is Karen Smith, and I am the Chief Financial Officer of Cypress Fairbanks ISD. And just to give you a little bit of perspective, um, some of the items that we will be sharing with you, you know, Cypher ISD is the third largest district in Texas. And I guess I would say pre-pandemic, we had 118,000 students. So some of the things that maybe we're able to implement may not be as feasible for your for smaller school districts, but hopefully some of the information we share with you may assist you in maximizing funding. As David, uh, Mark's kind of already went over some of the state compensatory education information, but in order to be eligible for state comp ed funding, a student must first be identified as educationally disadvantaged. And this is typically done by the completion of a household application to determine pre and reduced status. If a student is not identified as economically disadvantaged, the student will not create compensatory education funding. The, uh, David already shared that this year, once again, many parents may not see the need to, uh, or, or, or shared with the information, I'm sorry, about compensatory education students for 21-22, some of the options that will be available to be able to obtain funding. Um, this year, though, there may be the situation similar to last year if you are doing any type of virtual learning um, or, or if you're on the seamless summer option, parents don't really see the need to complete the application because they think either they're not at school or every child is eating free. So what that we're going to go over some of the items that we've tried to do to try to get our parents to complete the forms. Students um, identified as economically disadvantaged will be funded on one of the five weights. The weight will depend on the address of the student and the census-based characteristics of that neighborhood. So it's important to review uh, student addresses that you are unable to locate in the census data and really try to clean that up for the following year. It is crucial to establish processes to follow up on students that have not submitted their low income status documentation. So now I will turn it over to uh, Darren Crawford to discuss some of the processes implemented by Cypress Fairbanks ISD's nutrition services. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Darren Crawford. I'm the director of child nutrition um, here at Cy Fair 
ISD. Um, we're just going to tell you about some of the things that that we do, not just in child nutrition, but um, together as a group. Um, Karen, can you advance to the next slide for me? That is one thing that we do. We work seamlessly on moving the slides. Uh, so the first thing that it starts with really is the household application. Um, and as Lena kind of went over, you know, during a normal year, we operate an SLP, we take applications, we have processes in place for that. Um, this year was a little bit different uh, because initially, so we are gonna do SSO, I'll get that out there in the beginning. Um, that's the program that we will be operating. Initially, we had not planned on taking applications. Uh, because of some of the changes um, in the PEBT plan that was approved earlier this week, we're now going to be taking applications. Um, so we're not doing it exactly like we normally do because normally on July 1st, we have our applications online. Um, we do primarily electronic applications in SciFair. Um, our software company um, has an electronic application module. It's the same app that is used to look at student meals, uh, menus, accounts, et cetera. So we really try to steer our parents there because the approval process is very quick uh, because most of the information is looked at electronically. Um, we also have paper applications available uh, for families that don't have any technology access. So we always wanna make sure and have those available. If a parent does request a paper application, we will give it to them, get it back, scan it in and approve them just like we do the electronic ones. Um, some of the things we do to really promote that electronic application is we have an online registration. As part of that online registration, there is a page that gives you a link that takes you to the website where you would fill out the application. Um, and then that's for new students, for all of our existing students, there's an annual student update that the district requires from students. And there's also a link on that. So that's done electronically as well. So that's kind of the, I think the first thing we do is try to get it as electronic as we can. Um, direct certification is really probably the biggest thing we do um, in an effort to determine who is economically disadvantaged. For our district, it's right now about 62% of our free and reduced population, we identify through direct certification. Uh, the remainder will either be um, through a household application or a foster status or homeless status. Um, the way we do direct certification, and for those of you who don't know what that is, because I realize um, everybody on this call is not in child nutrition, um, direct certification is a process that the state enables us to do where we have access to upload our enrollment um, into a state database that identifies students who are on SNAP, TANF, or Medicaid. Once we upload our enrollment, we can download a file. And for those of us who have a software system that manages our eligibility, that file can be imported into that software system. Um, so the system that we use to get that information is called TXELMS. Um, it is a, a state database that is actually pretty current. Um, in the past, it, the information in TX ELMS was not super current. So it would run, I think about six months behind. I think now there is a 30 day lag from when someone is approved for benefits for SNAP, TANF or Medicaid before they show up in that system. So it's almost real time data. Uh, child nutrition directors are required to do a monthly upload of enrollment into that system. What we do basically from July 1st through the first month of school, I do a weekly upload. Um, the reason we do that is because of the high mobility with our economically disadvantaged population, there is a high likelihood that I may have kids who are enrolled in my district in July. Well, by August, they are no longer enrolled. Or by the second week of July, they may be no longer enrolled. If I do that upload every week, then I'm able to capture that student's data and know, hey, at some point, they were in our school district and they qualified through direct certification. 
then that goes into our software system. So if that student ever re-enrolls during that school year, we will know automatically because we've caught them. So that's why we do that weekly upload is just to account for the mobility. Because if we don't do that and a student moves out and then moves back in, we, we wouldn't know if we were only doing a monthly upload until the end of the following month if they were with us again. So I hope that makes sense. Um, so that's step one. Step two, in TXE LMS, there is an unclaimed EDG match um, that is available. And so monthly we run that. And what that is, I hope I'm not being too jargon heavy, um, an EDG number is a case number that is assigned by Health and Human Services for SNAP, TANA for Medicaid. So that's unique to the individual who qualifies for those benefits. What the EDG match, unclaimed EDG match report does is it identifies students who are in our district who have an EDG case match with a sibling that we've already claimed. So it just is kind of an alert that says, hey, potentially you have these students that would qualify based on a sibling match. Um, so we investigate those, upload them into our software system. With both the, the weekly or monthly upload from TXE LMS and that EDG number unclaimed match upload, um, the system does a couple of things. So most software systems will do an automatic match. So when you bring those students in, it says, okay, we have this student and according to their eligibility from this report, we're gonna establish eligibility for them as either free or reduced. In order for the match to happen automatically, there are several data points that have to match up, such as first name, last name, birthday. Um, what we find, and I think you know, anybody who's doing this process will understand that we always don't get a perfect match on that. Um, you know, when a parent fills out an application for benefits with SNAP, TANF, for Medicaid, and when they originally registered their child for school, there could be differences in last name. We see that quite frequently, um, where there might be a hyphen or a space uh, or two last names, but in one system, they're listed one way. In another system, they're listed the other way. Um, a transposition error on a birthday will fail to have an automatic match. Um, so the first thing we do after we do that upload is we start manually looking for kids that were close. If they hit a couple of those fields out of three and we can determine that, you know, hey, the birthday was off by one digit. Well, we're gonna go ahead and match that. The system will not. Um, so that is a manual process that has to happen in addition to the automatic process. It is kind of time consuming, um, but since we know that, you know, if we can qualify a child through direct cert, it is going to increase funding for Title I, Comp Ed, E-rate, you know, it is worth the time to do that. Um, so that's another reason why we do it so frequently in the summer. Since we don't have school going on, there is some time to, to go through and, and look for those students. In addition to the student matches, we also have sibling matches or household matches. So our software system, again, it will do an automatic match by household and what that entails is if a student has filled out an application in the past and has indicated that there are other students in the household, if we can match one of those students through direct certification, automatically those other students will become approved and eligible for benefits by virtue of being in that same household. So that is an automatic process, but then there's also a manual process of that where you know, in our particular system, we can run a report and it, again, looks at the data points. So if I can get enough data points that match, and then I check the guardians and see that, yes, these students live at the same address, they have the same last name, they have the same guardian, I can go ahead and manually match them as siblings. So again, that just enables us to increase those numbers of direct certification students. Um, in addition to direct certification, um, there are some other automatic 
qualifiers. So categorical eligibility, that is homeless and foster students. Um, what we do to make sure that we get all of those students is there is a constant communication the first month or so of school between our free and reduced lunch office and our student services office. Um, in student services, we have a person who is our homeless liaison. There is a foster coordinator. And we make sure that when students are identified in their office as being eligible for services by virtue of being homeless or foster, that they send us a report that shows that that student is homeless or foster, at which point we can categorically make them eligible for child nutrition benefits. Um, and then finally, with our carryover eligibility, as Lena alluded to earlier, each student has 30 days, 30 operating days of carryover eligibility with their prior year status, which means if you were determined to be free last year, for the first 30 days of school, you can still be free this year, but it expires after 30 days. So around the second week of school, we start making automated phone calls to every child that is still operating with a carryover eligibility status. And what that will mean is that they have not, they qualified last year, they've not reestablished status this year. Um, so we start automatic phone calls and we continue those until the October snapshot date, uh, because that's the real important date for the district for us to count them as economically disadvantaged. Um, just a note there that carryover eligibility does not work to count them as economically disadvantaged, um, even if the carryover eligibility is extended as it was last year. Um, so really the snapshot date is kind of our, that's our hard deadline, at least to get data that's usable for peeps. Um, so we start second week of school with the automated phone calls and then the third week of school, um, we start sending a weekly list to principals um, so that they and their staff can reach out and contact those families personally. Um, because you know what we find, and again, kind of the theme of our, our presentation, I guess, is going to be teamwork, um, is that it's knowing you know, who has the information, who has the relationships. Um, I can send twice weekly automated phone calls, that's not going to provide the same response as having someone at the school who has a relationship with that family giving them a call. Um, and we continue that until snapshot. So this year for us, like I said before, um, it was a little bit different um, because we are doing seamless summer option. All of our students will be eating for free. Um, we have another wrinkle in that we are partially community eligibility provision and partially not. Um, so that mixes things up a little bit. Um, so for our students who are not at CEP campuses, we are going to be soliciting those applications. Um, we chose seamless summer option. One, I think most importantly, and that's something I think everyone in the district understood is that all of our kids will eat free. Um, and I think that was the most important thing when it came to how will we collect this data. Um, we really, you know, made the decision as a district that we'll find a way to collect the data. Um, if we can feed all of our kids for free, that's what we're going to do. Um, from the child nutrition perspective, the higher reimbursement rates um, coming out of the last two years, which were economically kind of devastating, um, that is a great thing for our program. And so we wanted to do that. Um, but it's important that everybody, you know, in your district is aware of the implications. Biggest implication is going to be that we've got to collect that data, um, which that, as Lena said before, I think um, it's a local decision, you know, if you're going to collect the applications or not. Um, it must benefit child nutrition for us to use child nutrition dollars. Um, and as was said in the TDA presentation, you can do it in child nutrition if you're establishing carryover eligibility or potential PEBT eligibility. Um, so our choice there is yes, certainly for the potential PEBT eligibility, but we also want to establish the carryover eligibility so that next year when all meals cease to be free or if all meals cease to be free, uh, we're not going to be in a position where 
we will have students those first 30 days who don't have access to meals because they can't afford them. Um, you know, the final reason I think for us collecting the household applications is, you know, as you go through the various things that are funded by virtue of establishing eligibility for a child, for them to be economically disadvantaged, the only thing that 100% works in every program is the household application. So um, it was important to us that if possible, that we collected those. Um, so we really made the decision two days ago um, when we found out about the summer PEBT plan being approved to go ahead and start collecting applications. So we now have things online and we're really starting kind of an all out blitz to get people to fill out applications, hopefully by that August 28th deadline. Um, so like I said before, we do have community eligibility provision schools. Uh, right now we have 34 campuses. So that is about a third of our schools. Um, and you know, the one good thing about participating in that in the past is the data collection methods that we used there are going to help us as we approach this year when it comes to the locally developed household socioeconomic model. Um, because for our PEBT, our, our CEP campuses, um, you know, we will not be collecting applications because we can't collect a household application for a student who attends a CEP campus. We will be doing the locally developed socioeconomic form. And so we'll be collecting that for every program for those 34 campuses, which we have been doing um, in a partnership between several departments um, for several years. We will also, to supplement our household application collection, um, if there are parents that we can't get to fill out the household application, um, we will probably also, you know, we're gonna be trying to get them to fill out the locally developed socioeconomic income survey because it is a much simpler form. And if we have parents who say, you know, there's no way I'm filling out that application, my kids are already eating free. They might answer a two or three question survey. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Darren. And now I'm going to go over what our district does with the CEP campuses. Uh, David Marks already shared with you um, about how TEA has a sample form or uh, income survey. And uh, we've listed here the link for you, but then here is, of course, a copy of that form. One of the things to be careful of and be cautious is be sure you've got the right form and that you have collected the right form. Or if you're doing your own personal form, that you are updating the income information because that information changes annually. So what, how you determine that or make sure you have the correct form, you can actually go out to the Federal Register. Uh, once again, here's a link to provide that information for you, and it will give you the uh, income information for you to be sure you're um, obtaining the correct information. Then, um, in order to meet Title I requirements, um, that, you know, this income survey form is important for our CEP campuses to determine the economically disadvantaged status. So basically what we tell our parents and, and provide to them is due to the COVID-19 pandemic, all districts in Texas are eligible to offer free breakfast and lunch throughout the 2021-22 school year. Of course, with us, it's a seamless summer option. And as a result, we're using this income survey to determine if students would have qualified for free and reduced meals and we share with them that it results in um, additional benefits to the district, as well as additional benefits to their children. And uh, David shared some of those examples with you. Then what we are doing right now before school starts with our CEP campuses is, um, Darren mentioned that we have a, a, a link, um, you know, related to our child nutrition form when our campuses, when students uh, come in and families register their new students through our electronic uh, registration, and also when we do our annual student update. What we also have included in there is an income survey. And it's something that when they go in and they complete 
whether it's the registration, which it went live for us on July 1st, 2021, or our annual student update, that way we put it out there and made it live on August 2nd, and it's out there through September 3rd, 2021. And that's where we get additional, uh, you know, any updated information such as addresses, phone numbers, email addresses, et cetera, that we need um, regarding students, um, whether it be families or student information. And so what we do have out there, here's a copy of the survey that we put out there. And the reason we have it out there is we're hoping, one, it can help us with CEP campuses, but two, it helps us to get information if we want to follow up and then later send out to families that have indicated like they qualify on the income survey form, the child nutrition form, if they did not go out there and do that. We can run a report to determine um, who completed this form and appear to have qualified. So it's actually embedded, um, in whether it's of the online enrollment or the update, and they're required to complete this information um, as they're going through in order to finish the whole process. Now, one of the things that you have to have in there that you'll see in this next screen is they do have the option to choose not to provide that information, but at least the ones that have provided it, it has helped us to follow back up with those particular families. And what we do once school starts at the CEP campuses is um, September 13th through 28th, we collect the income surveys for all the ones that are enrolled um, without one currently on file. So what we do is similar to Darren, we do like an email, uh, we send it out through email. We also uh, text it out through school messenger. We even do the phone calls through school messenger and we get with the campuses and ask them for their help too, by providing information directly to the campuses. So um, in, in October, uh, October 4th through 15th, we, with the CEP camps at the campuses, the principal receives an email with a PDF of the pre-filled forms for all students uh, still missing results for the income survey. And the campuses then request parents to complete the form. And then our registrars can then go in and put the results in eSchool. That's the uh, platform we utilize. Um, and then the final deadline, we tell them to get that information to us is October the 20th. So our district plan of kind of what we're planning to do this next year um, is for the non-CEP campuses is to encourage them to complete the household application as part of the carryover eligibility. And then uh, with the CEP campuses, of course, filling out the income survey. Also, we do provide training uh, to our registrars uh, so that they know what to do and have a kind of a training with our principals so they're aware of what to do. Because we believe that, as Darren indicated, our campuses know the stu their students the best. Parents are much more likely to complete something when they received an email from the campus versus completing something when it comes from the district level. And then Darren shared uh, one of the things that we like to, wanted to provide you is the importance of just communicating among the different areas. It's very easy to operate in silos and not realize uh, the importance of communicating if there's not a partnership. What can happen is you can lose funding because of the legal requirements were not met for a particular program. For example, uh, food service may not see the need for completing the household application anymore if they have adopted the seamless summer option, but not completing that form could affect other programs. Obviously, some of the legal requirements out there that's already been shared with you was on PEBT, but also there's uh, regulations associated with E-rate. Um, I provided the link on the uh, USAC website where the required proof of low income eligibility is out there related to E-rate. 
the uh, F FCC allows a mechanism, other mechanisms that you can use other than that used by the Department of Agriculture to determine if a child qualifies for free and reduced lunches. Um, an example would be like CEP campuses is another mechanism, um, the income survey. In addition, um, for E-rates, participation in Medicaid, SNAP, SSI, um, federal public housing assistance, and then low income home energy assistance programs are acceptable. But interestingly enough, they do not allow the TANF. Um, they said it is not an acceptable form for E-rate purposes because the guidelines are not always equal to or below the income eligibility guidelines for the National School Lunch Program. So the key that they utilize is whether it's equivalent to that of the National School Lunch Program. So it's important that the district work with campuses and parents so they understand the importance of completing the form, not only, as I mentioned before, that it would be, uh, provide funding to the school district, but also that so that families can benefit from some of the special services that they can receive. So in our district, some of the essential departments that we feel are very important to include is uh, obviously child nutrition, but the finance department, we work very closely with curriculum and instruction because in that area, that's where we have um, uh, our Title I uh, uh, programs. And, and so we work with them on what needs to be done. Our PEAMS department, because we need to make sure that we're doing the proper training with our registrars, that we're capturing the proper information, that everything is coded correctly. And then um, for uh, student services, that's where we get the information that Darren mentioned about foster and homeless students. And we work closely with technology to be sure that um, we have options such as adding, uh, you know, the links into our online registration for new kids that are enrolling in our district. And then also our campuses. But this, uh, we found that this partnership and constantly working together to figure out um, how to make things work has really, number one, it keeps it from being too hard on any one campus. But it, I mean, I'm sorry, any one department, but then the other thing is it's really benefited us um, in being able maybe to capture more dollars. And this year we're kind of concerned about our campuses. We, we know that they've already got so much going and there's so much responsibility. So what we're trying to do is we will be providing them like information say when they have to send out emails that, uh, that it, it's standard. We have sent the information to them with the link in there so that all they have to do is cut and paste and just send it out from the campus, as well as utilizing School Messenger to get that information out. But we're trying very hard to give that information to them so they don't really have to do much except provide the information to parents. And uh, included here, we'll also be providing our uh, presentation uh, that to uh, to David Marks and they'll get that information out there to you and it has our email addresses. I did include Dr. Ashley Claiborne who was going to be a part of this presentation because uh, she's the one that's primarily in the Title I area that takes care of the uh, getting those income surveys for us. So now I will turn it over to the next presenter. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I am excited to be here with you today. My name is Jamie Muffaletto, and I am the Data Standards and Governance Manager here at TEA. Today, I'm gonna to take you through the free and reduced lunch coding that's reported by the local education agencies to TEA when this data is due. And then I'll be passing it along um, to talk a little bit about PEBT benefits and then to E-rate. So let's go ahead and dive in and talk about the data that's going to be reported. All right, the first piece of data that is going to be reported is the NSLP type code. Um, so for any of my PEAMS folks in the audience, this will be element E1591 in the data standards. 
This element is reported in our PEAMS fall submission. Um, this is going to indicate a campus's National School Lunch Program participation status. Um, you will be reporting this for e every campus within your local education agency using the code table that we're gonna review next. So, and here's the code table. Um, but before I get into this code table, I need to point something very important out. Um, this code table is going to look a little bit different um, than the one if you were to go out into our data standards and look at right now. Um, so if you went out there, you are going to see um, something a little bit different on the code table 212. Um, a post addendum version of the Texas Education Data Standards will be published on September 1st. In this update, we will be adding to code 01 what is in yellow on the slide. Um, which is the addition of including the seamless summer option or SSO. The seamless summer option is an extension of the National School Lunch Program. So if the campus is participating in the seamless summer option, but is not a provision to or a community eligibility provision um, campus, they're going to want to select and report the code 01. Uh, we had a lot of questions about um, this in the past year, and we thought it would be great to go ahead and add that to the code 01 because that's what we're going to want to use. So for just a minute, I want to talk to the PEAMS folks out there, because um, I'm going to get into a little PEAMS jargon that some people might not um, understand. So PEAMS folks, put your ears on for a second. So the NSLP type code is an optional data element reported in the school extension complex type in the PEAMS fall submission. There should be one school extension complex type for each active or under construction campus registered in ASK 10. Obviously, if the campus is under construction, you're going to have that school extension, but you're not going to have an NSLP type code. Um, but I wanted to mention this because now is the perfect time for the PEAMS folks to get out there and to ask Ted, make sure you have all of your campuses updated, any that were under construction or now active campuses, um, so that this will help you as you start getting into your PEAMS submission. Um, so let's switch gears just a little bit. And we've talked about the school level. Let's talk a little bit about um, the student level. So the next, next data element is going to be the economic disadvantage code. Um, this is element E0785. This data element indicates a student's economic disadvantage status and is reported in the student extension. It is a mandatory data element and it's reported in both PEAMS fall and PEAMS summer submissions. Um, the mandatory element is going to use code table C054 which is called the economic disadvantage uh, code table. Um, so I've put that up on the screen for you. There are four different codes that can be used. On the following slides, we're going to look at um, the different ways that you're going to use these codes. So let's jump in into actually looking at how we're gonna get these kids um, coded. There are three options and everyone's been mentioning them. There's been lots of talk about um, the three different ways and three different food service options you could have. Um, and those three options are the traditional claiming, the community eligibility pr provision or CEP. And I'm gonna refer to it as CEP from now on because it's a lot easier to say. And then our provision two. I'm gonna take you through all these options um, we are going to look at the codes, and all of this is from our CO54 table. And what I'm about to go through with you is what is currently listed in our data standards. Um, it is under the student extension complex type, um, and so nothing is different than what we already have posted out there. It's just going to look a little different because I tried to make it in a manner in which it might um, help as, we, as we're moving forward with it. So first up, let's take a look at traditional claiming. So what happens with traditional claiming um, is the local education agency, agency is going to distribute the official free and reduced meal application. Child nutrition can take these applications 
and use the income listed to qualify students for free and reduced price meals. As TDA mentioned earlier, child nutrition can process these applications and qualify students for carryover benefits. And so even if you are participating in that SSO, you can still distribute the official free and reduced meal, price meal application and child nutrition can process them for the carryover benefits. In addition to the free and reduced price meal applications, um, the LEA will use traditional claiming, will review all enrolled students against that direct certification list for free and reduced lunch eligibility. It's really important that they are looking at that. Cypher talked about how um, they'll do it once a month, but as at the beginning of the school year, doing it more frequently once a week, getting those kids that are on that direct certification list um, is gonna be really beneficial to everyone. Um, so now that we're, we've discussed, we've got a regular um, campus that is participating in traditional claiming. Um, they're passing out those free or reduced lunch applications. They're looking at the direct certification lists. Now let's look into how they're gonna be coded for that PEAMS fall submission. So if a student just doesn't return the application that's sent out, or if they do return it um, and the income is too high, that student is going to be coded with a zero zero, showing that they're not identified as economically disadvantaged. Um, but when a student does return the meal application and the income qualifies for free meals, or the student does show up on the direct certification list as eligible for free meals, the LEA is going to use the O1 for these students. And as I just mentioned, someone in the district should be comparing enrollment um, to that direct certification list to make sure you're not missing any of those kids that would qualify for free meals based on that, um, that cert direct certification. As we all know, everyone, if you're on an SSO, everyone's eating free. But it is still important because we do have another year that's going to happen after this year um, that we do get those kids um, those carryover benefits so they can start the 22-23 school year not having to worry about that. So we do have two other codes. Um, when a student returns the application and the income qualifies them for reduced um, price meals, um, you're going to use that O2. And then there's also on the direct certification list, a Medicaid reduced price lunch um, or breakfast. So those kids would get the O2 as well. Um, so last I wanna talk about is the code 99, which is our other economic disadvantage code. This code will be used by a local education agency um, when they are using a local income form or something other than the official NSLP form to qualify a student. Let me give you a real good example of this. Um, there are some local education agencies that has a pre-K program. So to qualify students for pre-K under income, the local education agency might use a local income form. Um, if they use that local income form and determine a student um, would be economically disadvantaged, um, they can code them a 99. Um, since they did not fill out the official NSLP form, they can't be coded 01 or 02, but um, because they were working to qualify for pre-K, um, you can use that 99 um, to qualify them. So let's keep moving on and let's move into the CEP. Um, and so again, that's the community eligibility provision. Um, the child nutrition department will review enrolled students against all direct certification lists for free or reduced meals. Um, additionally, the campus will distribute a local form to all of our students who are not on the direct certification list and to all new students. I do want to put, point out the last bullet on this slide. This is very important, so I want to bring it to your attention. The CEP program allows all students enrolled on the CEP campus to eat free meals. But 
the only students that you're going to be reporting with an economic disadvantage code are going to be the ones with the direct certification list or your locally developed income survey form. So let's take a look at the different codes and see where we're gonna use them. So first up again is our OO. So that's gonna be our not identified as economically disadvantaged. So these are going to be for our students that are not on a direct certification list. Um, and also when a student returns the local income application, if their income is too high. Um, and so again, you're not on the list, you're going to be given a local form. If the local form never gets returned, it's going to be a zero zero. Or if when it is returned, um, that student's income is too high, they're going to be a zero zero. So while the student is enrolled at the CEP campus, the student will still eat free, but their economic disadvantage code will be zero, zero. So for our zero one are eligible for free meals. These are going to be students that are on the direct certification list as eligible for free meals. So again, those are the only kiddos that you're going to be reporting with an O1. CEP campus, they are going to be on that direct certification list. So as we move into our O2s, um, this is similar to our O1. Um, so this code is only used if the student is on the direct certification list as eligible for reduced price meals. Um, the last code, our 99, this is going to be used for students that are not on a direct certification list, but remember we talked about you need to send that local income survey home if they return that local income survey um, and qualify, um, their income would, would meet the requirements for free or reduced, then they can be coded in 99. Again, CEP campus, only your kids on direct cert are gonna get an 01 or an 02. Those kids that fill out the local survey and meet the qualifications are going to be a 99. Again, all of these kids at a CEP campus are going to eat free. You're wanting to ensure you have the proper coding for all of these other pieces um, to make sure that you are maximizing any additional funding you can get for that campus. So as promised, we have our third, um, which is provision two. And so we're gonna talk into provision two um, in two kind of chunks. Um, because the first year is going to be different from the second and subsequent years in the cycle. Um, and so the first year, the campus is going to distribute the free and reduced price meal application. The campus is also going to review enrolled students against the direct certification list for free or reduced lunch um, eligibility. So looking at our um, codes for our base year, so this is year one, um, you're going to be a zero, zero if the free or reduced lunch application is not returned, or if the free or reduced lunch application um, income is too high. Um, and so those are gonna be our zero zeros. Um, our zero ones are going to be where our income on the application um, meets the criteria for free meals or if the student is on one of the direct certification lists as eligible for free lunch or breakfast. So this should start sounding similar to traditional with the exception there is no local income survey. I wanna point that out, okay, no local income survey here. And um, so when we get into our O2s, again, um, the application that is turned in for free or reduced meals um, the income meets the reduced price um, uh, qualifications, um, or the student is on the direct certification list for the Medicaid reduced price lunch or breakfast. Um, in the first year for a provision two, code 99 is not going to be used. Again, no local survey at this point. Um, and so you cannot use that 99 in that first year. But when we get into our second and then our subsequent years after that, um, the school is going to distribute a locally developed income survey 
to all new students and any student that did not have continuous enrollment. So what I mean by continuous enrollment is let's pretend we have a student named Leonard and Leonard was enrolled in Penny High. Um, Penny High is a provision to school, um, but Leonard withdrew for six weeks. He went over to Sheldon High um, and ended the year at Sheldon High, but then he returns back to Penny High the next year. Leonard would need to fill out a locally developed income survey. Um, so it's very important if it's a continuous enrollment, um, there's nothing that the parents have to do. But if a student is new to the, CE, uh, to the Provision 2 campus or the student had a break in enrollment, then um, they're going to have some things that has to happen. They need to have a locally developed income survey, which goes into what we do for coding for our Provision 2 schools in the second and subsequent years. So anyone that was coded 00, they're going to stay 00. Um, because they're not identified as economically disadvantaged. And then in addition, any new students or like Leonard, a student that left and came back, um, they're going to have to have filled out that application. Um, and if they don't meet the qualifications for free or reduced meals, they're going to be coded zero, zero. Um, and so at this point, it is based on the local application. So, and then let's talk about O1s. So for a student that was an O1 in first year, as long as they continuously enroll, they're gonna roll up to an O1 um, for the next year and then subsequent years of provision two. When we look at O2, you're seeing the same thing. So any of our kids that are continuously enrolled um, they are going to keep that O2 coding. Um, there is no need for them to fill anything out unless they leave and then come back. But this is when we get to use our 99. So the other, uh, the other economic disadvantage code should look a little different on this one. Um, it's not used in year one, but it can be used in year two and subsequent years. So as I mentioned, all new students and any students that did not remain enrolled, so Leonard, um, he was not continuously enrolled, will need to have that locally developed income survey sent home to be filled out. If the parent fills out this form and based on the income that they list, the student is economically disadvantaged, it doesn't matter if it is, it is eligible for free or reduced, you're going to code these students with a 99 because you use that local um, income form. So all new students that are identified as economically disadvantaged um, in the second and subsequent years um, are going to keep that code 99 um, coding. So it's really important to look at is that um, there is a little bit of a difference between first year for provision one and then the second and subsequent years. So now that we've talked about all this coding, um, I think your next question will be, when are we sending this in? Um, so let's take a look here. Um, the campus NSLP type and the student's economic disadvantage code are both reported in the PEMS fall submission, which is sometimes referred to as just submission one. Um, this reporting is based on what we refer to as the snapshot date. And that date is the last Friday in October. So this year's snapshot date is October 29th. And so really what snapshot date is, is that all of your enrolled students on that last Friday in October are who you're going to be reporting information on. Um, and so all of your enrolled students, um, you're gonna be reporting that economic disadvantage code and all of your active campuses, you're gonna be reporting that NSLP type code. Um, so the data is due for the first time um, to TEA by December 2nd, um, but we do give everyone a chance to fix any errors that you might find, and you can resubmit that by January 20th. I do need to point out the bullet at the very bottom of this slide. Had a lot of questions about this. 
At this time, there will be no extension on the collection of free or reduced price lunch applications for the 2021-2022 school year. All students will be coded based on any applications that are received on or before Friday, October 29th. So last year, um, LEAs were given the opportunity to continue to collect applications all the way up to the resubmission date and change coding for those students. But at this time, um, whatever their economic disadvantage status is on October 29th, is what you will be reporting in December 2nd. And then again, if you do a resubmission on January 20th. So I really wanted to point that out, get you guys prepared. Um, SciFair definitely gave us some great um, ways to start getting those applications out to parents because um, that's really important. Um, need to get that um, coding and that qualification by October 29th. So I wanna thank everyone for being with us today. I know this has been a topic of a lot of, of conversation and just questions and things like that. I am now going to pass, a, pass the presentation off to Leanne Simons here from TEA, and she is going to talk to you guys about the PEBT benefits. Jamie, before we do that, um, I just wanted to see if you could cover a couple of, go back to a couple of, of the slides um, specifically the one around CEP um, and how to code those students. We're getting a lot of questions about that. So I just wanted to see if you could um, repeat that. And then um, we're also getting a lot of the same questions around SSO um, and does that really change the way that they should be coding their students as economically disadvantaged? And so I think so me, based on, go, go ahead. If I can go ahead, let me address the SSO first. Um, SSO is um, everyone is going to eat free. Um, and so it's really important. And then it's going to be based on um, if you are sending out the um, official um, school lunch applications. So if you are fit sending out those official school lunch applications and your ch um, child nutrition is qualifying students for the uh, carryover benefits, you can code those students using an 01 or an 02 if you were under that, if you would typically, if you're sending out those applications. So that is not going to change as long as, as child nutrition is qualifying them for free or reduced price meals. What we're hearing though is a lot of districts are not wanting to send out the NSLP form. And so they're sending out a local form. And you using a local form, you're not able to, uh, to code the students with an 01 or an 02. You would need to code those students with the 99, um, showing that they are economically disadvantaged and they were determined to be economically disadvantaged through something other than the official um, meal application. So when it comes to the CEP campuses, um, the CEP is based on um, direct certification. Um, and so um, I, I, if your campus is a CEP campus, um, you are going to be coding your students eligible for free meals or eligible for reduced price meals based on the direct certification list. There is not going to be a, you're not sending out that national school lunch application. Um, you are using a locally developed income survey. And so um, if the student is not on the direct certification list, you'll send out that local survey um, when it gets returned. If the student qualifies under income, you're going to code them a 99. Really and truly, if you think about this, uh, the CEP, remember direct certification list, you can use the 01 or the 02. If you're using a local income survey, the most they can be is a 99. 
um, it, as long as they qualify. Everyone that returns a local application are not just gonna automatically get a 99. You still have to qualify them under income and then you can code that 99. Um, but the bulk of your kids will be on a direct certification list and you're gonna be coding them with the O1 or the O2. So Leanne, do you think that covered a little bit of it? Yes, I think so. Awesome. So let me- I still see some more questions coming in, but I know we've got two more presenters. So I wanna try and get, get through. Yes, and we're happy to take these offline and make sure we get y'all get answers. We know this is a confusing time. Um, it is for us as well, and so we're here to help. Um, so Leanne, it is all yours. All right, thanks, Jamie. Awesome job. Hi, everybody. My name is Leanne Simons. I am the Assistant Director of Data Standards, Data Quality, and Business Analysis. Um, and so I just wanted to talk very briefly. I know uh, Lena covered a lot of this during her presentation, but I just kind of wanted to cover... Um, the summer PEBT program um, for this for this year. And so the state plan was approved just this week. Um, we received um, verification from Food Nutrition Services. Our HHS received that on Monday, August 16th. And so I just kind of wanted to cover briefly the eligibility. And please know this is just an early preview of this information. We are still, um, you know, as Lena referred to, we are working on a media campaign. Um, communications, training. We are working on all of that to get this information out to you all as soon as possible. Um, there are also some um, small uh, scenarios that have been brought to our attention related to summer PEBT, and we are still working through those. But at a high level, I just wanted to cover the um, eligibility related to summer PEBT. Um, the first one being that um, the student must have been enrolled in the last month of the 2020-2021 school year. Um, the student must have been NSLP certified for the 2020-2021 school year in order to receive um, or to receive free and reduced price meals or they attended a CEP or P2 campus. And so that, that was the requirement for the 1920 and for the 2021 school year was that the student must have been NSLP certified. Um, or have attended a CEP or P2 campus. The way we identified that was through the PEAMS coding that Jamie just covered, which was through the O1, the O2s, and the 99s. And so um, the third bullet we are covering, this covers for any student who becomes newly eligible. So they were not eligible in the 2021 school year to receive free, free and reduced price meals, free or reduced price meals, but they became eligible on July 1st or after. So anybody who becomes eligible, you know, based on their economic status, um, becomes eligible um, on July 1 through August 28th, um, we are asking that the household application for free and reduced price meals or the NSLP form be completed and returned to your school no later than August 28th. Districts will have time to process th those forms, but we do need for the parents to complete and return them to the schools no later than August 28th. As you see underlined below, there will be no extension granted to this date. This is the date that is in our state approved plan by, uh, that came from uh, FNS. Um, another, and then what we'll, what we'll do is we'll use that to help determine if they're eligible for summer 2021 PEBT. Um, the next bullet is that a socioeconomic form cannot be completed to be eligible for summer PEBT unless the student is attending a newly eligible CEP or provision to school. So I just wanna, um, this is recent clarification I just received from the Texas Department of, of Agriculture just yesterday. Um, and so again, I just wanted to clarify this is that a socioeconomic form cannot be used to determine eligibility for summer PEBT unless the student attends a newly eligible CEP or P2 school. And that when we say newly eligible, we mean eligible for the 21-22 school year. Again, the last bullet says that there will be no extension um, for these forms for summer PEBT, um, that August 28th is a hard date. And then benefit issuance. I know that there are going to be a lot of questions about how are, um, how are HHS, TDA, and TEA going to be issuing these benefits. Um, and how will we identify all of these students? So we are in the process of identifying 
all of those requirements. We will be sharing details very soon. Um, we are we are daily working on the communications and press releases and uh, media information and training. And so the, the team is meeting daily. And so we will be sharing information um, in the very near future. I just wanted to cover anything uh, or cover 2122 PEBT, which is basically we don't know anything at this point in time. Requirements have not been um, issued by Food and Nutrition Services at this time. So we do not um, have any information related to 2122 PEBT, how it's going to work, what the requirements are, or anything like that. So I just wanted to cover this briefly, um, and I will now turn it over to Julia Shockrell, who will be talking to you about E-Rate. Great, thank you, Leanne. Good afternoon. My name is Julia Shockrell, and I'm the Director of Strategic Projects here in IT. I wear many hats, and one of them is the State E-Rate Coordinator. So we've received a couple of E-rate questions that I just kind of wanted to run through pretty quickly here. Um, the first one is, will locally developed income surveys be allowed to determine eco-discs for E-rate? So the answer is yes, but the survey must meet certain guidelines as outlined by USAC. And um, there is a, an alternative discount mechanisms page posted on their website, which outlines all of the um, necessary requirements to qualify. And I will we'll also post this in the chat shortly. Next slide. Do non-CEP students have to complete a household income survey? So this would be a local decision and would, and would depend on how the local education agency chooses to qualify those students who meet certain income eligibility guidelines. And the next question. What exactly does E-rate look at in regard to CEP? So again, I would point you to the Community Eligibility Provision website. The documentation needed to support your CEP percentage for E-rate is the approval of your SFA application for participate in the CEP. And the document must include the following information for each CEP school site. The name of the school, the number of identified students, the enrollment, and the identified student percentage um, a B multiplied by 100. And so since E-rate is you know, extremely complex, if there are any additional questions, please feel free to enter them into the Q&A. We'll be carving off those um, questions and providing responses in writing to ensure we um, give you guys accurate responses. And with that, I think, um, oh, I'm sorry. I did have one more question. Thank you. Um, so this was, um, is it allowable for a local education agency to match federal funds to purchase hardware equipment through the E-rate process? So yes, this is allowable. The E-rate isn't, uh, the LEA is not considered, considered double dipping. They're just covering the cost of the remaining equipment. Uh, pretty much all E-rate is looking at is to make sure you're not double dipping. And now I guess I will turn it over to the, um, the panelists. We're going to open it up for Q&A. Thanks, Julia. <clears throat> All right, let's scan through the chat. And see what we can start with. Actually, I'm gonna go to the Q&A side. David, would you like me to maybe bird dog some of these to y'all? Um, no, I'm good. I'll, okay. I'm, just, I'm gonna start reading them out and I'll call on someone as we um, uh, have an answer, so. Uh, will, will you provide examples of documents LEAs are using to determine the economic status if they're not using the National School Lunch Form? Those were pointed out um, in um, Karen Smith's SciFair's um, presentation. So TEA has a form up on our webpage under COMPED. Um, and then um, she also um, showed forms that she was, um, that her district uses. And so uh, Darren also touched on that. Our district chose summer seamless. Sorry, I told you I'll do that. Uh, seamless summer option in the National School Lunch Meal applications. If a household does not submit a National School Lunch Meal application, may we have the household complete an income survey to code these students as EcoDisc for PEMS purposes? 
So yes, uh, Jamie went in uh, a lot of detail on, on the coding side and Jamie, is, if there's anything you wanna respond to in that question. I think, um, I, I think go back, when we send out this presentation, um, which we will do um, and post it, um, take a look at the, at the different um, programs um, and there are ways to um, still be able to code those students, um, at least with a 99, if they did not um, fill out that NSLP form. Um, but just remember, you can still, if you're participating in SSO, um, think about those carryover benefits. Um, think about that first day of school next year. I know it's hard to even think about next year, um, but remember, the more kids you can qualify for next year, it'll make your, your moving into next year um, a lot easier. Um, this first part of the question might be for, for Darren. Um, a parent indicated they received SNAP on the socioeconomic form, but the student is not in the direct cert file. So in that case, do, would they code a 99 other economic disadvantage for this student? And if, uh, so the first part would be um, potentially Darren, and then if not Darren, then um, I think this goes back to, to Jamie's slides and, and how they code students and um, spending time with, with those slides on making those determinations. So there'd be a couple of different ways you could do that. If they're indicating SNAP on their, um, I'm, it says socioeconomic form, but the socioeconomic form, it's, I think they're referring to the household application um, because on the household application, you can say, I received SNAP, you put your EDG number. Um, there are a couple of ways a district could handle that. One, what we would probably do is look up that EDG number in TXE LMS, see if we can match the student. Um, if we can match them, we claim them as a student that's in our district. And then the next time we do an upload of direct cert, they would become a directly certified student. And in most software systems, that direct cert is going to trump any application that is in there. Um, so that's going to become their new status. So they would be, you know, an 01. The other thing is, if you couldn't find a match or you didn't have time to go and look for a match, you would make them categorically eligible. And I think with that categorical eligibility via SNAP, that's going to be reported as a 99 in peaks. Thank you. Um, might be another one for you. Um, uh, I'll, I'll start with my answer and then you can elaborate. Um, so can a student be determined eco disc based on a local income form or only the, the national school lunch program form can qualify them as eco disc? Uh, no, there's, there's many ways uh, and you've heard, um, each of our presenters uh, talk about uh, making that determination of economically disadvantaged. And so uh, the National School Lunch Program form is not the only way to determine if they're, they're economically disadvantaged. And Darren, I don't know if there's anything that you wanna add or, or Lena or Karen. The, the only thing I would throw in is that that household, the socioeconomic form, like that isn't going to qualify them as economically disadvantaged for Title I. Like it will work for Comp Ed, it'll work for E-Rate, but for Title I, it's our understanding at least that that won't qualify them. Yeah, and well, and also we uh, didn't mention direct certification is a great way to, to qualify that those kiddos. And so if they're, um, if you can certify them through those means, then um, that seems to be a good way to do that. And David, this is Lena. I want to make sure that I clarify that even though everyone can eat free under the SSO option, direct certification activities have to continue. So that process where we are matching students and identifying them as directly certified and eligible for the program will continue throughout the school year. That's a great point. Thank you, Lena.
Um, what if they are claiming another way and a student is listed on the direct certification? Um, I'm, I'm guessing, Darren, that they're, they're claiming, um, they're, maybe they're claiming through an application form, but they're also listed on the direct certification. Right, so in those cases, like if a student has an application on file and they qualify, but later they are found in a direct cert upload, the direct certification is going to take precedence. Okay. Um, and then um, if students are coded 99 instead of 01 or 02, then this, then this will prevent LEAs getting funding for E-rate or state comp ed. Jamie, do you want to take this one? I think we still have some discussion that needs to happen on that question. Um, but we will definitely be getting additional information out um, on the, especially on the E-rate impact. Yeah, for state comp ed um, purposes, the, the 99 um, does work. Um, um, so, you know, as y'all are aware, that's a state program. And so um, a local eligibility determination um, will work for those students uh, for state comp ed purposes. And for the E-rate purposes, we are definitely going to be taking a look at that and we'll get some additional guidance out there. Um, and we'll also probably be updating our, educa our Texas education data standards um, with um, any information we determine um, that will be helpful for E-rate as well. Hey, David, this is Karen um, Smith, is that I think I noticed there's a little confusion related to um, that um, ECODIS form related to Title I. And it, you know, uh, like Darren said, it doesn't qualify them for that and what he's referring to is the non-CEP campuses, uh, where we utilize it for Title I purposes, because you have to do some type of alternative sort of uh, determination, is we use that for our CEP campuses. Yeah, that's good to note. Thank you, Karen. Um, so then we have um, an easy uh, softball one for, for the group. Um, can we also get a copy of the Q&A? And we will, uh, we're not going to get to all the questions in this, these last few minutes. And so um, we will um, get, huddle back as a team and uh, review the questions and, and um, we'll put a response out through an FAQ and it'll be posted in the uh, TEA um, COVID webpage under child nutrition is where both this presentation uh, or a copy of all, all the presentations that we've done today and then also um, an FAQ where we've addressed um, more of these questions. There was a question, David, I'd like to address, if you don't mind, that I Sure, saw. go ahead. Um, someone asked, was the, the NSLP application a mandatory form? And I just wanted to make sure that we are clear that <clears throat> even before COVID, before the, this uh, year's operation, that form cannot be mandatory. It is optional at the household's discretion to submit that or not. So um, we can't force them to complete it one way or another um, to get additional data. And then I just wanna make sure I clarify the comment about CEP and that you may not, may not use the NSLP household application for a CEP campus. That is the exception. The CEP and the P2 
campuses are the exceptions in which a socioeconomic local form may be used to establish eligibility for PPT. I just wanted to clarify that because I think I, I've seen some comments in the chat and wanted to be clear about that. USDA does not allow those forms to be accepted at campuses that are um, deemed CEP or PT. Okay, thank you. And then I think we're gonna wrap up, um, but I did wanna remind y'all of the chart that um, TDA um, sent out about the benefits or my, the, the last slide in my presentation about the benefits to, to students and their families. Um, uh, there, there's quite a few out there for them um, if, if they're determined to be economically disadvantaged. And so um, I appreciate all of your time today. Um, I certainly appreciate uh, my panelists' time and, and um, the support that they provided to us. And, and this presentation and, um, and FAQ will be um, posted um, shortly. So thank you all and, and have a good day.